right. Thank you for tuning in. 24 minutes before 10 o'clock. Thank you. The, uh, the one thing I've said many times on this show is that my favorite genre of book is a biography. And the reason for that is because in, in a biography, um, quite often, you or a memoir or an autobiography, whatever you want, a, a true story about somebody's life, you, you see hints of, of, um, of things that may be familiar to you. Maybe you say, oh my gosh, I can relate to that. That sort of happened to me or... That's the kind of life I lived, and, and or, or maybe not, or maybe something totally removed from you, and then you say, oh my gosh, look what this person went through. And, and quite often, what a person goes through is their own doing. Maybe you made some mistakes, maybe you did some things right, you know, or the person that were, you're reading about did. And, and, and in many cases, it's how other people treated them. Uh, for n- through no no excuse uh, no good excuse anyway no fault of their own maybe that's what I'm trying to say here um, Janice Alice oh my gosh what a cute girl she was on on the cover of the book I'm looking at a young picture of her I, su- I hope that's her and on the back she's uh, got a picture of how she looks now and just a beautiful smile um, she's gorgeous Janice Ellis wrote the book called From Liberty to Magnolia in Search of the American Dream let's find out about this story if you're looking at the podcast that's the cover of the book which I got off of Amazon which by the way the book is doing really well on Amazon uh, Janice Ellis good morning Janice Good morning. Good morning to both of you. So good to be with you. And where are you? Are you in Mississippi? No, I'm in Kansas City. Um, I, uh, Mississippi is my home. Kansas City is is my home now. Okay. Um, and you are a doctor? Yes, PhD. Wow. And uh, you've been writing columns for more than four decades on race, politics, education, and other social issues. And so it's an honor to have you on the show with us today. Do you um, attribute what you went through to the era, to the location, um, or something else that I'm not thinking of? Uh, well, culture, society. I think you, all of it. I, I was born in Mississippi and grew up in the very turbulent times during the Civil Rights Movement. And I was really subjected firsthand to um, a lot of racism. And then, of course, I confronted both racism and sexism during my career. Uh, but I'm happy to say that, you know, you, per- you persevere. You just keep going, and you don't let it uh, color you or make you bitter. And you don't judge a whole race of people by the few. What you just said right there, the, the way you get through it, how did you get that wisdom? Was that something you learned from life or from your parents? Well, you know what's so ironic? Um, my, my parents, of course, uh, suffered the greatest brunt of racism and segregated, oppressive Mississippi. Uh, the Klan burned, um, you know, old crosses on our lawn, and my dad and my mom suffered a lot of uh, disrespect and injustices in the cities of Magnolia and Liberty, the name of the book. We grew up on a farm in between those two cities. And would you know, in our household, my parents never spoke about how we ought to, re- to perceive and view white people. We just did not, we did not, they did not uh, convey to us kids any bitterness, any, any judgmental um, uh, attitudes. What they did convey was our safety. They did not want us, quote, to uh, talk back or be disrespectful because they thought harm would come to us. So I I give credit to them. I also give credit to my faith. Um, I was born in in, in 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 a Christian environment. My dad was a deacon in the church. My grandfather was a very known preacher at the time. So I credit my parents and my faith for my attitude. In the book, back of the book, you give credit to God and thanks to God, but you also thank worms. I, you, ha, you can't help but laugh when you see somebody thanking worms. <laughs> I, I guess I should let you explain that one for our listeners, right? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. And, you know, at my age now, I love gardening, but my <laughs> husband has been so kind. He, I plant, he harvests because I have a phobia that I cannot get rid of. What happened as a girl? 
my dad grew cotton and corn and all the vegetables that we ate. It was seven of us. And my four brothers were cruel, and my sisters were, too, to some degree. <laughs> so but what happened is that uh, during the cotton picking season, you know, you have caterpillars all over the top on the leaves of the, of the cotton stalks. And I would be picking... Uh, cotton in between my two brothers and I guess I was going too slow for them because I would literally bend or break the top of the cotton stalk so that I wouldn't see the worms so, you know so <laughs> when I pulled the cotton out of the little and what they were doing as I bent the stalk and or broke it they were taking the little caterpillars off and putting them on my sack oh, and my oh, no. Oh, and then about by the time they probably had 10 or 15 on there, one day my brother said to me, uh, they call me Faith, that's my middle name. He says, Faith, look, look back on your sack. I did, and I thought I saw a hundred, I thought I saw a hundred worms. <laughs> And I was screaming hysterically, and my father, who was in another field plowing a mule and a plow, and he drops the plow, he runs to me, and he thought I maybe had been bitten by a snake or something, and he comes to me, and he looks, and I'm hysterical, I cannot talk, and he said, what, he asked my brothers, what did they, what happened, and then he saw the worms. He calls my mother, and he says, take her out of here. Get her out of here. I do not want to see her in this field anymore because she's going to lose her mind. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Screaming, screaming like that over some little worms. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't go back to the cotton field except to take ice water to, the, to my sisters and brothers mid-morning and mid-afternoon. And do you know what they would do? They wouldn't meet me with the worm and dare me to say anything. Oh, my so, gosh. Wow. That's actually a so, fond memory. It, that sounds cruel, but you know what it is? It was love. I know that's kind of a crazy thing to say, but um, they, you could, you know, I know from being a brother that's what that is. Uh, yeah, of course. And then, of course, I felt very inadequate because I was the one uh, not out there. So I learned to cook at nine really good from scratch, and I delved into books. I wanted to get good uh -huh. grades my parents proud and uh that that attitude financed uh all of my degrees my bachelor's both masters and my phd how were you accepted through your schooling how was it different from when you were in elementary school through when you went to college oh my you know i went to an all-black uh elementary and high school bus past a white school to get to the you know less adequate black school and in in college I went to Tougaloo College, which at the time was the headquarters for the civil rights demonstrations. You had Martin Luther King, Julian Bond, Stokely Carmichael. They would assemble there at that college to organize the demonstrations, the, the nonviolent demonstrations in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, they did that. I went to Tougaloo for two years. But when Martin Luther King was assassinated, I felt, my gosh, I have to do something. So I left Tougaloo College and went to Millsaps College to further integrate Millsaps College. Both of those schools, uh, by the way, are academically rated very high among uh, private small colleges. Yeah. And so I went, I went to Millsaps and helped integrate Millsaps, and that was an extraordinary experience. You know, we have a school in Daytona. Uh, it's Bethune. What's it? What's Cookman. It? Bethune, Bethune Cookman yeah. College. And the, and the lady who started it, Mary. Oh my gosh, uh, Mary, Mary Bethune. Yeah, yes. she is going to be honored. She's she's an African American woman. She's uh, no longer with yes. us. I don't know if you know any of the history of here. Yes, I do. Okay, so anyway, so she's going to be honored. We have a stat. Every state, I guess, has two statues up in a statuary in uh, Washington D.C. And the two people that are represented by those statues are supposed to be people who came from your state and who contributed to this country. And so we have a statue of a guy who was uh, responsible for air conditioning. And then we have one a general from the Confederate Army. And so they will remove the Confederate Army guy and replace it with uh, Mary Bethune Cookman. And, and uh, it's, it's, I think she'll be the first African-American woman honored in, in the statuary hall with, uh, with a statue. So, 
Oh, wow. I Just, see. <laughs> I, I guess I'm bringing it up only because, you know, we have made mistakes in this country and we have treated people less than fair. And little by little, that's starting to change. And, and maybe now we're, we're finally starting to level the playing field for you ladies. Well, well, well yes. Yes. It, you know, to a great extent, that's very true. We've made a lot of progress in the last 50 years, but we still have a little ways to go. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to women, uh, you know, advancing uh, in corporate America, it's been a, it's been a slow haul. Uh, and, 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 and minorities and blacks, I'll give you just an example. In the Fortune 500 companies, uh, you only have 23, 24 women now who actually lead uh, uh, those companies, and uh, no African Americans. You had five at one point. They're either retired or um, no longer there. And so, yes, yes, and no. Uh, my experience, uh, you know, I, I write my book because I felt compelled. I had to because I've sort of lived uh, the different sides of racism and sexism in America. Um, I worked for a large pharmaceutical company. They had an evaluation system where it was either um, unsatisfactory, good, uh, excellent, outstanding. In the six years I was there, I made all outstandings. They, 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 and a great salary. They would send me to Maui for two weeks nice. based on my performance. All expenses paid. They would give me the largest screen TVs available. <laughs> but... They never promoted me from director to vice president, irrespective of my performance. Mm. Even when I negotiated, negotiated a multi-million dollar contract with some of the largest health care providers, I never was promoted. Wow. So, that's, yeah. that, says something, that says something pretty embarrassing. So, so do, uh, you ran for the office of mayor. What city was that? Uh, Kansas City. Oh, okay. And, okay. Yes. Uh, I, I worked for... Uh, the longest tenured mayor outside of Daly in Chicago. I worked for Henry Meyer in Milwaukee for about eight years. Oh, he was a was nice guy because I oh, was yes. up there at that time for his uh, mayoral duties, and he was a nice guy. Yeah, a very nice guy. And he was. He looks at my resume when he hired me and looks straight through my political science degrees and my communications degrees. I just knew I was going to do policy and speech writing for him. And he looked at my mathematics training and assigned me to the city budget. And in the meantime, oh, he wow. um, asked me to, I, I share this with you, he asked me to develop a, a new budgeting system for the city, which I did. And the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities um, adopted it as a model. And then uh, they, wanted, they were invited to an international symposium in Bonn, Germany. And uh, guess what? The mayor invites me to Bonn, Germany to present it at the international symposium. I share this with you because, again, we have a little ways to go. Okay, so I worked for the mayor for eight years, developed the budgeting system, uh, and then the budgeting director retires a couple of years after we got back from Germany. And what would you guess? He calls me in my office, in his office, and he says, kiddo, he said, you know, I know you could run that department with your eyes closed. You created the budgeting system. But if I put a black woman over the purse strings of the city of Milwaukee, the south side will vote me out, and blacks will not vote at all. <gasps> oh. And, 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 and so, and so, and so. I didn't get promoted, and so I, I said, well, Mayor, I believe I've taken you as far as I can go. I've worked with you. You've been the best. He was wonderful. I, I, work, I work with you. I said, but you know, he said, Janice, you can be the task commissioner. I said, I said Mayor, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand property appraisal. He said, but you're a quick study. You, you can get it. He did everything he could for me not to leave, but I left anyway. Mm -hmm. And the news, the Milwaukee Journal, and, and took him to task for it, you know, because he, he, he did not promote me. And so uh, fast forward to Kansas City. I met my current wonderful husband, um, some, you know, 30 years ago, and he lived in Kansas City. Uh, it was rumored, and not rumored, but speculated that I might be the first African-American mayor in Milwaukee had I stayed there. And I, but I didn't stay there. I, I thought, well, you know, I found the love of my life. I'm mm -hmm. going with him. So I came to Kansas City, and when the first African-American mayor retired, uh, uh, was term limited out, I went and I talked to every 
African American council person in the city of Milwaukee and said it was three then and said we need to run whether we win or not. You know, it sends the wrong message that there is no one else who, uh, who a person of color who who is not qualified to run the city. So I I jumped. They said no. I jumped into the into the race, never having run for elective office. And do you know I lost that race by 1,100 votes. Oh, I lost, wow. I, wow. I did so well, I lost the primary by 1,100 votes. But again, again, the race card uh, was played. There was another woman and um, another man. It was three of us uh, in the primary. And, and, and um, the, 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 one of the candidates, and I'll just be, be real uh, discreet here, uh, circulated a, uh, a flyer throughout the city saying, how would you like to have a black marketing executive for mayor? Well, mm-hmm. when the newspapers when the newspapers saw the uh, the flyer, they ran an article, uh, brought the candidate you know to task. The candidate apologized, but still, you know that was that was like you know a week and a half before the election. <laughs> Wow. Uh, And and what I said in the opening is is you're just demonstrating that when we hear other people's stories, we always say, wow, this person did this, that and the other thing. And that's how they accomplished what they did. In your case, you did this, that and the other thing. And you still you still had wall to the gosh, my my headset just echoed back at me. You still had some obstacles that were of no fault of your own. I think that I think that I mean, you're showing us the. The, uh, the, the pursuit of success um, is not always achieved by excellence alone. A lot of times it's simply by people being prejudiced or, or, or not prejudiced, I guess, is the best way yes. to say that. Yes, that's exactly right. And let me just share two classic examples with you. Um, in, in high school, of course, it was an all-black high school, but there was a science teacher and his wife who saw my ability, and so they encouraged me to apply for college. My grades were good, and they said, you may be able to get scholarships and work study. And, sh- and sure enough, I did. But at Millsaps, an all-white institution, the same thing happened. I started at Millsaps as a math major, and my math professor was so prejudiced that one day I was proving an ab- abstract um, theory in abstract algebra. I had done maybe 12 pages of computations, and I wasn't getting anywhere. So I said, Dr. Uh, X, uh, can I stop by your office this afternoon because something I'm doing something wrong so that you can look at my work and see where, where my assumptions may be faulty. I walk in his office. He never looks up at me. He hands his hand, extends his hand. I gave him my 12 pages he looks at them, marks them in red, puts them on his desk, and slides them back to me, never looking up. I was so wow. struck. Oh. I was so struck by that. I turned when I left out of his office. I turned the wrong way and walked directly into a wall. But, oh, but, but and so you know what I said. At, at Millsaps, you had to take comprehensives just like you do your PhD to in your field to graduate. And I said, there is no way. I'll be able to get out of mathematics in this college because this, the chairman of the department won't even look at me. And so he never made eye contact, never said a word. So then I said, well, let me change my major. As I would have it, my communications professor was just the opposite. And he encouraged me to do my extemporaneous speaking or my written uh, manuscripts about race relations and my family and how I perceived it. And he allowed me to do my, my, my assignments on race relations. And then he said, Janice, do you want to go to graduate school in communications? He said, I'll look up, help research the best uh, universities in that field. And at the time, the University of Wisconsin, Princeton, and Yale, in that order, had the best reputation for communications, um, for a communications department. And, and, and so, look at that. I mean, you know, yeah, I had, yeah. I had it, yeah, he was very helpful. And, 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 and to your point, you know, um, had he not been, maybe I wouldn't be here. So, and, and no matter what my, my strengths are, my, my training, or my abilities, you're right. It's who you encounter. And throughout my career, I'm going to tell you this, I have walked into many places professionally and walked into a room and wondered, what did they see first? 
do they see? Oh, do we ask a black person or a woman? Thing. Yeah, uh, exactly. and, that, oh, and that, that's an interesting thing because while your, your, your fellow uh, African-American males might have some of the similar experiences because of race, you had not only that, but you had to deal with men being stupid, and like we're finding out about the whole Me Too movement. One of the stories in the book is about a guy who uh, um, was hinting that he wants some favors. Right. Honestly, I, you know what? To this day, I work for this large pharmaceutical company, and at one of the manager's meetings, the, the president and CEO takes photos of me, send them to me with a message saying, I saw this lovely lady, <gasps> and I cannot, get, I cannot get her out of my mind. Thought you would like these pictures. I left the office that day, went to my husband, and went home quietly, and Frank said, Janice, what's wrong? I said, after dinner, I just need to show you something. I just need to make sure, you know, that I'm not misinterpreting this. And I showed him the note and the photos. And he said, God, Janice, God's hitting on you. And, and I said, you know, I work real hard. I do. I travel. I traveled day. I, there were weeks I would be home, not at all. And some weeks I'd be home one day. Mm. And I said, I'm not going to sleep with this guy to become vice president. Uh, vice president. I'm not, I'm not going to play the game. Right. I worked yes. hard. And then, so, but prior to that, I was the president and CEO of a, a healthcare insurance company. And, that, and I would have so much difficulty trying to get the board who, who had conflict of interest everywhere to reinvest in the company for a great data system uh, to track patient outcomes and so forth. And I had the chairman of the board at a Christmas party whisper in my ear and tell me that, you know, I needed an ally on the board and that, you know, he'd like to get to know, know me. And if I'm nice to him, he'd help get my stuff through. Oh, and I my said, gosh. I said, I said to you, I said, I'm going to pretend that you didn't say that to me. And that's what I said to him. And I'm going to be honest with you, the next year was living hell for me. And, and, that, that, and so I, and I got a, a lawyer, and the lawyer told me, we can dissolve the board. I said, I'm tired. I'm just tired. You had, I, weren't there a couple of other ladies on the board also, and they kind of told you there's nothing, nothing you can do about it? Nothing I could do about it. That, that I was single. I, had, I was divorced at the time with, two, with, with, with raising my boys. And, uh, and the chairman of the board asked me, what do you do socially? You, you've never seen. I said, when I go home, I have two boys. Yeah. And I, I, I'm raising my boys. And the two ladies said to me, essentially, you know how men can be. You have to be nice to them, and it doesn't help that you're single. <gasps> Oh, my gosh. Those women are uh, so out of touch. You have uh, written a book me. that will open a lot of eyes. I, I hope we see you someday on, on the ballot for president. I, I will, yes. uh, I'll put a little mark next to your name. Exactly. Uh, Janice Ellis, I don't know what your future holds for you, but I, I know you've taken your past and you've made something that may not have been so comfortable for you, but you've, you're showing us exactly what we need to see in order to make ourselves become better, I think. Um, you took a lot of time to do this. Thank you for doing this. Uh, the book is called From Liberty to Magnolia in Search of the American Dream. Janice S. Ellis is the author. I have a copy of the book. If you want it, call me right now. The rest of us have to go buy it. I found it on Amazon. I have 10 seconds, Janice. What's your, a good website? Uh, Janice S. Ellis. Dot com. Easy enough. Uh, Janice, what an honor to have you on our show. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you for having me. Fox News Radio. Well, I'm Chris Foster. We believe President Trump will be signing off this morning on the release of a classified memo claiming FBI bias in the Russia election meddling investigation. When that memo might come out, we do not know yet. California Democrat Adam Schiff says... This is designed to impugn the uh, credibility of the FBI to undermine the investigation. White House counsel Kellyanne Conway tells Fox... The president has stated many times that he respects the rank and file of the FBI. And that this is about a few bad actors who are biased against the president, she says. An execution in Texas. A lethal injection ended the life of John David Battaglia, who in 2001 shot and killed his two little girls while their mother, listening on a speakerphone, yelled for them to run. Shortly after the lethal injection started, Battaglia smiled and asked, am I still alive? And then, ooh, here I feel it. 22 minutes later, he was pronounced dead. Fox's Jack Callahan, Fox News. You report, you decide. 
For many businesses, hiring is tough. You want access to highly qualified candidates fast. And you don't want to sign a long-term contract or pay upfront fees. That's why you need Indeed.com, delivering six times more hires than any other job site, according to independent research. Indeed is offering new users a $50 credit to give their first job post premium visibility as a spot.